And we're live, opening up the Pocket Now mailbag, answering your questions this week. We're also going to have a quick chat about net neutrality, because a lot of news went down there. And we've got the top stories from PocketNow.com, plus a special guest drops by to help us ring in the holidays. Otto Huseman will join the conversation. We've got a lot to talk about, so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 280 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Recorded November 26th at noon Pacific, this weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile, smartphones, tablets, and wearables, and the industry surrounding them. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid, and Thanksgiving wasn't just an awkward shopping speed bump on the way to Christmas. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, editor at Pocketnow.com, joined as always by plucky podcast producer Mr. Jules Wong. How's it going, buddy boy? I mean, I just relaxed over here at Hayato's house, which we're both in different rooms, and, and it's nice to be somewhat in the same realm as someone, and, you know, we have a real-time conversation, just as we had with uh, Ryan Wu last week. Well, and, and it's hilarious. You guys are actually like owing the bandwidth to try and keep two streams of Google Hangouts, Google's <laughs> yeah. sinking Google. ship of a streaming video service uh, going, which is amazing. But the spoiler that uh, that Jules just delivered in that little intro is that Bro, dude. Hayato is on the show. How's it going, man? <laughs> it's going good. I'm, uh, I'm still tired because yesterday we took an impromptu trip to Chicago to visit another Pocket Now alumni, but uh, doing all right. But some good travels. And and again, uh, I just have to ask you guys all well fed from from last week. You guys get your oh, yeah. uh, your stuffing, your turkey, all that fun stuff. Overfed. Nice. It's good. That's the way to be. I, in our family, Thanksgiving is a week long celebration of cooking and eating through all of our favorite restaurants and all of our favorite recipes. So yeah, you back to a uh, uh, family in New Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. We spent the weekend in Albuquerque and. Um, had a really full house, and Lex was bouncing off the walls like every uh, every well sugared and well fed two year old should be. Well, I mean, that's the only way a two year old should be. So that's the only way a two year old should be is uh, again. You're so grateful for manual modes on smartphone cameras. Otherwise, she would have just been a, st- a blurry streak in every photo, not being able to lock down that shutter speed. So it was good. Yeah. Times. Yeah, uh, good times for all, and we hope to continue those good times into the latter part of this weekend when we're trying to get ready for the work week and we're just trying to stuff this show in so that you can have a little bit of excitement after all that shopping and whatnot. Uh, if you want to participate in this show, we would gladly have you on. Uh, hashtag PN Weekly on Twitter would be the best place to uh, leave your comments, leave your questions, leave whatever you'd like tech-related. And uh, as always, we have this end of the month mailbag that we're doing now. And if you want to contribute something to that too, you can do so at podcast at pocketnow.com. That's podcast at pocketnow.com, as well as the PN Weekly hashtag, all for you. And uh, we certainly appreciate it. Yeah. No, this is uh, this is the the new structure of the month is making sure that we're getting to that mailbag and having uh, listeners take the wheel more frequently than we used to, where it would just be sort of uh, whenever it was a slow slow news week. You know, people people wanted to actually talk about things that were relevant, but hey, you know, good times. I mean, we already have a, a, a lot of chatter. We, we uh, Unfortunately, our schedules just got crisscrossed, so we uh, we put up a yeah. tweet yesterday saying we were going to go live. So we already have a, a number of great tweets. Uh, Jules, you've got the actual emails, but I think we do have a couple news stories that we want to chew through uh, from the, uh, the, the top posted stories at pocketnow.com. Yeah, indeed. So uh, let's just chew through them because we only have a few of these. Uh, and we'll Get start- it? Chew through them the week of Thanksgiving? Like we're eating them? Like they're food? I know. Get it? <laughs> but speaking of that, if you're trying to get to grandma's or to your son's house or wherever that you're trying over to go. the river and through the, through the woods? Is that? Yeah, yeah, through the woods over to, I don't know. Uh, but if at least if, you, if that house was in the 48 states, the lower 48, as well as Alaska... <laughs> You had some testing. But not Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the roads there are kind of tough, and the cell tower, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I don't know. You couldn't <laughs> afford to, but there was some... I'm really trying to yes and you here, and it's not working at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get through the story, dude. It's like it's like <laughs> this is how they're testing the thing. But anyways, like uh, this group 
uh, did a, a testing of uh, highway reception on all the major networks, and uh, they found that AT and T and Verizon basically traded first place in terms of coverage and in terms of speed. And then the bottom two, Sprint and T Mobile, of course, were still kind of uh, you know where they're at. And you know we've been hearing a lot of narrative, a lot of uh, a lot of yelling from John Ledger of T Mobile. Oh, hey, we're improving our network. We're more people and we're getting more speed and we're actually faster than Verizon now. So it's kind of this, maybe that might be true and maybe you're getting all these tests in optimal conditions or whatnot. But in terms of just having a good old fashioned, you know, high budget, you have to go through all these roads and all this network to find you know, empirical results. I think you know, Global Wireless Solutions is the firm that did this. Did a pretty good job in terms of uh, covering all their squares. So there you go. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I think it, so we're loosely structuring this week's podcast. I thought you were going to hit the news block and then we'd go back and cover no, 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 it. We want to no, talk, no. talk about the carriers. I don't know, Hayato, what's going on with T-Mobile, man? Uh, they keep saying they're like super good and stuff and... Uh, they're still not super good, so <laughs> no, it was. Can you, can you just get like a like a Timo guy on the phone and say, "Hey, uh, six months ago, I was a Timo guy." <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of throwing this to you awkwardly no, to help us save our show. It's, uh, Timo was great in in Indianapolis still, but uh, we went to the OnePlus event in New York last week, and that was yeah. all of Manhattan. T-Mobile was really rough for me, so. Yeah. I well, it's the same experience I've been having with Sprint out here. Like in the Valley, Sprint took a long time to get their their cell tower reduction initiative underway, where they were at one point supporting five different wireless technologies between uh, Nextel, their actual CDMA, LTE, and WiMAX. And uh, it's still out here in the Valley. You'll hit one block where it, it is. It's almost literally block to block where you'll hit amazingly fast downloads and then you're on like 0.8 megabit per second CDMA <laughs> 3G. And then you'll drive a little bit further and you're back up to what's like we sort of expect from an LTE speed. It doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that the humongous infrastructure that uh, AT&T and Verizon sort of had subsidized um, early in the carrier game has now grown to a point where they're more ubiquitous when it comes to some kind of actual usable coverage. And there's always that uh, figure of, oh, uh, that Sprint brings up of we're within 1% reliability of Verizon. Um, and even, you know, forget the fact that the difference here is more like maybe 10% or something like that. Uh, the f what we're really trying to say here is like, what's the difference between a 98% reliability rating and a 86%? That's it's a 12% difference, but what does that actually mean for you know completing downloads and completing streaming? And you know, if one if one task gets moved from LTE back to 3G back over again, does it stop? Does it fail at some point, or does it just actually go through? I mean, there's still a lot of nuance that could be had. I think the network analytics uh, in terms of um, global wireless solutions, they said that Verizon uh, had much more network load and that they had older technology. Uh, so even with those uh, second best speeds and best coverage. So... Mm, well, and Hayato, so is, this, is this kind of data, the kind of data that you think actually moves the needle on consumers doing business with a carrier? Uh, I'm sure to some extent. I mean, when I was working at T-Mobile, pretty much everybody would come in and ask, you know, hey, I'm on Verizon, I'm on AT&T, and uh, they would want to look up a, uh, look up a coverage map. But um, I don't know if numbers really mean all that much to the general consumer as much yeah. as, you know, just, just an infographic. Or even <laughs> actually testing the network out, but... A good pretty picture will go far. <laughs> for uh, you know, to, to be fair, I'm talking about myself too. I'm I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty sold on a on a picture before yeah you, know, you just throw numbers at me. <laughs> it's like one of those excuses where they jump onto a different network just because there's a phone on sale and oh wait it's on X network 
uh, I'm not going to go on X network because anymore. I don't even think that having special deals on phones really moves the needle much on carriers. I think I think the dollar amount is now becoming one of the primary factors, and uh, yeah, that's where I think T-Mobile was was really making their headway on AT and T's investment in their business <laughs> a couple <laughs> years back from that failed buyout. Uh, that's to me, I think, has been the biggest play. The fact that they have been improving their network in city centers, that's obviously a benefit. But I think subsidizing their their packages, whittling down their options and making their plans as simple as possible for as many people to kind of figure out a family smartphone plan has been the biggest win for T-Mobile. And that's obviously a, an area that it took Sprint a long time to even start competing against. And they don't have quite the same panache as Jean Legere does whenever he does these uncarrier announcements. Yeah, and when Ledger like just goes at, at them, it's still just marketing. It's still just you know saying that we're the best for. And really, when it's our job to really dissect, okay, this is the best for this kind of user. This is the best for that kind of user. And with these you know parameters, so. Uh, vague and you know we can't cover them all in the best way possible it just makes it harder for us to really say okay this is the definitive network for you and uh, Renato Laporte using the PN weekly hashtag on Twitter just showed his T-Mobile download and upload speeds using a speed test oh boy uh, 257 meg down 45 meg up you gotta love small countries. That's T-Mobile in the Netherlands, and I'm <laughs> kind of jelly because that's faster than my home cable connection. Because yeah, that's I bother competing that. with actual data services and ISPs and carriers in the United States in a capitalist country when you can just have de facto monopolies instead. I mean, that's fine. That's totally great. We'll get to that in just a minute, though, because we got some more news, and um, this one a little bit more. Uh, on the v developer side, but uh, we'll just, I think we can get through this. So Swift, uh, we know it as the open source code of Apple's choice, but Google has apparently been working on this uh, more and more as the founder, uh, the creator of Swift has joined Google uh, on a software engineering capacity. But in any case, we've seen uh, Google make its own rep repository for what it wants to do with the code. And there's also this new branch towards the mysterious Fuchsia OS that we've been ha hearing about on and off. It used to be this like Andromeda kind of operation uh, that we were talking about. It was being rumored uh, where it merged Android with Chrome OS. And now uh, the main speculation about Fuchsia is that this will get Google off of Android, off of uh, the Java base that it's on because it's still fighting Oracle after what eight nine years almost a decade now uh, for you know uh, just copy pasting some code uh, saying it's fair use so that debate still rages on in the meantime uh, we're not even sure if this uh, will get past all the hoops and barriers it needs to to survive so there you go but Swift at Google uh, they're really trying to branch out into more languages. We have seen, we've seen that with Kotlin for Android uh, recently. And um, I think people say that it's the best time alive, the best time around to be a, a developer. So, yeah. So what <laughs> keyboard do you use, Hayato, since Jules isn't going to throw to <laughs> either of us and he's just going to say that there you go. I have no I, I don't know what the lineup is, guys. I can't help you segue <laughs> if I don't know what the stories are. Um, what what keyboard are you using on your phone right now? You're using uh, I'm using the Apple keyboard uh, on my your phone. phone right <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up Google keyboard all the way. Yeah, I, I, I kind of stopped playing. I, I like Swift. Actually, uh, Swift was the. Uh, was the keyboard of choice before Google sort of made theirs uh, more easily accessible. Um, but anymore, the combination of Nova Launcher and Swift is, is kind of just what I turn to. Um, one, one thing that I think is kind of interesting, did you guys catch the story? This is sort of tangentially related 
to yeah. uh, to this. Did you guys catch the story about Project Treble as we go with Oreo forward? That because of Treble and because of the way that updates are going to be rolled, that this might actually deliver an easier pathway for developers to do custom ROMs. Um, so that when updates are pushed, that they can utilize the services of Project Treble to keep custom ROMs better up to date. I was wondering what you guys thought that if that might move the needle a little bit more on some of these um, non Android one, but less expensive or mid ranger phones that always seem to sort of die on support after a year or so. Yeah, it definitely could. I mean, that's, that that's sort of kind of like, like a, uh, like a user done sort of Android one on their own, you know, like, like a, like a DIY Android one program. Um, maybe hosted on XDA, I'm sure. <laughs> but on the other hand, I mean, if you're talking about official support, which people are just, it, it comes with the box, it comes with the phone. So if you want comp uh, support from the company, you get it. But if it's only going to last a year, I, I don't think they still have to dedicate a person to dealing with the Galaxy uh, J5 Prime King Edition, you know, those kinds of things. So it's it's getting to the nooks and crannies of all that and having to dedicate even one bit of labor to that in order to support just, uh, well, thousands of people, but it's, it's certainly not, it's certainly not the way that uh, project, I mean, project triple is great in general, but in terms of us, well, this is one out. of the things that I think that I think will be kind of tricky is Google is, is putting the crackdown on the implementation of their APIs. Like how, uh, accessibility options were being used very creatively, for example, as a more recent kind of shutdown or crackdown. So they're looking at at stopping apps from miss what what I think Google would consider a misuse of the API. So if Project Treble only extends into the developer space as a way to kind of create custom ROMs, I wouldn't be surprised to see a Google backlash against something like that. That's not really what the intended use of Treble was, unless these developers can make sort of a good faith argument that they're keeping their base of, of uh, users well supported using these Google tools. But again, they're not going to have any kind of certification process through Google for custom ROM building. Because if they want to work with uh, Google's whatever assets, they have to serve both sides. They have to do software and hardware. Uh, and uh, it's just uh, because, yeah, it's not really, it doesn't really make sense for them to not, not do that. So we just got another tweet using the PN Week. I mean, we've gotten a bunch of tweets using the PN Weekly hashtag. I don't want to make it sound like you guys aren't talking. We're, we're seeing the chatter here. Uh, well, we're getting one every, every seven minutes. <laughs> but um, this is from Andrew Wallace just kind of commenting back on speed test runs. So with Renato getting, what is it, 230, 230 down and 45 up. Uh, in central Missouri right now on oh, Cricket, Crick. you can have the fast high-speed data download four megabits per second and four <laughs> megabits per second upload. That's some screaming fast data. Now, I have to um, wonder what the plan and what whatever it is because already you're topping out at eight megabytes per second by being on Cricket. That's their stated speed cap. If you're on the unlimited like light plan, it goes down to three megabits per second so <laughs> i mean we're not really uh, th that's the conceit of at and own like hey we're gonna you know uh make sure that you're serving all these people but we're going to reduce the quality of the service so that we can uh, price it cheap but not as cheap as the other as the competition because really why would we want to do that when we can make more money and have less stress on our networks. So, Hayato, I need you to get on the phone with John Legere and figure out what's going on. All right. <laughs> I mean, you can do hey, it. Hey, man, I ran, a, I ran a speed test uh, a few minutes ago. I got 45 megabits down on T Mobile. So, look so at one fifth the speed of the Netherlands is what you're saying. Yeah. Which is. So, uh, we need to get John Legere on the phone. We need to figure this out. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get him on the Hangout right now. That's oh, thank you. Please do that. Uh, I know we, we need answers to these questions. I'm getting, I'm getting 176 down with Project Fi. I don't. I paid like up the wahoo for this, but yeah. I mean, running that speed test, Jules, just kicked you over into your next gig, though. So that was an extra 10 bucks. No, that's I true. Think. Exactly. I mean, they prorate it, so it's like you know a dollar 86 or whatnot. But 
great, great. I'm paying, paying more. All right, um, let's get, dig into a little bit of serious uh, subject here. Uh, I'm wondering which one of you would be more inclined to uh, do a ride share or something like that. As as a passenger or as a driver? Yeah, there, as a, as no a passenger. Way I, a I mean, well, if you're, a pa I mean, in Uber's case, this affected both. But um, they, they had a data breach. This happened uh, back in October 2016. And um, it was found out in November by then-CEO Travis Kalanick. He has since left the company. But apparently uh, the point man on all this is the firm's uh, security head, who is now under investigation. And... Basically, they just kept this, uh, you know, they, it was 57 million customers and drivers. And that information was names, it was email addresses. It was not payment info or anything, uh, but in t up to 600,000 of those drivers did get location data uh, compromised. So, and also their license numbers, too which is a huge deal. And this has been an ongoing, ongoing thing with Uber where they've hidden uh, and have treated customer privacy and uh, security very poorly and have gone out of their way to run amok uh, and away from regulators by concealing their activities. So that's one side of the story. And then there's also the second side of uh, the story that um, Hayato might be a little bit more... Uh, page in terms of Google's activities for Android users too. Uh, sure. I mean, uh, let me, let me pull up the uh, story yeah. real quick. <laughs> I'm honestly, I, I, I'm a lot more familiar with the Uber story uh, personally. Oh, but, oh yeah. Um, go. Ahead. Uh, let's talk about Uber. I mean, you've, you've written it several times. I've used it on a daily basis uh, just to commute to when, when it's like 2 a.m. and the subway system's closed. So <laughs> and it, to think that, you know, when you're not aware of what's being done, when you're just relying on a, a interaction between you and your driver and then having the company sort everything out, for you, um, and then you realize, oh, it's this giant obelisk that is Uber that you have to be angry at because in order to make the service possible with contractors and all that, you have to onload a whole bunch of tech support stuff that people don't necessarily have to see. And you know, if something like this got out, um, I would understand that people would be a little bit more suspicious of the service. So, Well, it, again, it's, it's what... It's the public facing and the customer relations side of this business. So we're talking about Google powered mobile devices, keep tabs on you. And then through Wi-Fi connections and cell towers, they're tracking locations and they're using that data. And we know that they've been doing this for a significant period of time to make their geolocation services more accurate. Um, what's more disturbing about the Uber situation is that this breach happened a while ago and that there was no yeah. disclosure about what happened and what information was was leaked. And that if, if some of these reports are accurate, that Uber was in the process of paying off hackers to try and keep the story quiet, not in, you know, disclosing that they had been compromised, making sure that their users were were safe. The hackers had found a way into this data and Uber's reply was to try and bribe them to keep quiet about it, which seems way worse than when you find out that your your Google powered device is tracking your location, which we all kind of know it is because we're using services that rely on our location and Google is serving ads on our location. Even it seems if, uh, if less you're nefarious specifically than the direct comparison. Yeah of that you know you're specifically opting out of google's services and you happen to just live by uh google's uh you know apps without those services if you can the thing the major problem with that was that they outsourced uh, all, all their cloud tech uh, uh you know transactions from out of google into a third party and that has been collecting 
all the location data regardless yeah. of whatever agreement that you made with Google anyway. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm saying that's yeah. bad. What I'm saying is the difference is, is that let's say that third party entity had been compromised by people trying to get into that system and get user data. And instead of reporting that to Google or to the users, that third party data collection service paid off the hackers to try and keep them quiet. That's right, what here, Uber did. That's why it's worse. <laughs> I'm not saying the Google situation is good. I'm just saying the reason why this Uber situation should be more enraging to the public is, again, every single time a company screws up, it's an opportunity to join the conversation with your users and to try and engender some sense of security or goodwill. Uber has dropped the ball now a couple times. And yeah. this is, again, a service that I've, I've ceased doing business with. When I do ride sharing, mm -hmm. I do Lyft. I'm sure Lyft isn't any better secure than than Uber, but they've yet to fail me in the way that Uber has just demonstrated that they can't keep data safe. Yeah, and when, if they can't keep data safe, then in term, in addition to all the judgments it makes on uh, issues such as you know surge times at JFK when there's a whole protest going on. I mean, that's, uh, I don't know why people, uh, why investors continue not uh, launching money into this thing, but I mean, it's still, it's still alive. It's still losing money and it's still a thing. So ugh. it's still a thing. It's still a thing. I'm no matter how much we want to, we want to put it away. So, Hayato, tell me why is Uber your favorite ride sharing service? <laughs> well, is it I, terrible I also, the treatment of employees or is it all the data breaches? What do you like better? I also only use Lyft when I can, but uh, I, I do kind of wonder what it'll take to make sort of the general public um, turn their backs on Uber. Because no matter how many things like this keep on happening consistently, yeah, it seems like Uber is still, yeah, yeah. Uber is still. I think they're they're still far outperforming Lyft. I could yeah, be they are by but... factor of maybe two or something like that. Uh, there are they're still on Google Maps as a suggested rideshare option, and on several yeah. other transit-based apps that suggest rideshare. It's usually Uber that they have. It's that name recognition, that kind of yeah. name that's like great or powerful in German. It's like they're super. So. Um, you know, I, and they're just more sleek. They have all these other options that make it, you know, cool that if you want to get a limo, a little mini limo, if you have to, Uber X or Uber Black or whatnot. Like they yeah. have, they have more fleshed out options. They have more people, and people kind of like they have, uh, uh, they have more leverage to hire drivers with uh, like introductory uh, uh, bonuses. So, and Lyft has been trying to start to do that, but. It just hasn't been able to match the pace. Yeah, <sighs> man, this is depressing. You want to talk about personal driving for just a second, or not even sure. personal driving? Let's talk about this company, this startup, this this thing that uh, I think there's a person called Elon Musk involved. I don't know. I've heard of that guy. I don't um, know. I, 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 it sounds like he does the the men's cologne line, right? Yeah, must yeah. be Elon. Must yeah, the must be Elon. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so you, you have all these things with, with uh, Tesla going on with its rockets. It's able to you know spend billions of dollars sending things up into space and then reuse those rockets. Uh, it built a hundred megawatt battery in South Australia. It just got finished with that too. So um, congratulations to them for that, I guess. But now. Um, when we talk about their electric cars and we're talking about their charging infrastructure and their superchargers, um, you would think that they would have uh, the capacity with all this technology to make a battery, uh, you know, a charger, a power, a power bank for phones uh, that is competent and it's, you know, works nice and, you know, is also designed properly because Tesla likes to tout its design. So um, I'm wondering if uh, I'm going to send you the link in the thing. You take a look at it, and I'm wondering if you're going to be willing to uh, pay forty-five dollars for a power bank. Oh yeah, I caught this. It, this is uh, a. I U will gladly spend forty-five dollars on a power bank, 
I will yeah. happily <laughs> not spend forty five dollars on a Tesla branded power bank just because it's Tesla. But it's but it's a whole thirty three hundred fifty milliamp hours, and it has wow. micro, not USB C. USB. It can almost one to one charge like a Galaxy S eight plus <laughs> on Qi pad too. <laughs> like literally, it's point five watts. That's you can literally charge at that rate. Putting it down on a wireless charging. So, how do like when, last time? I think we were in. I think we were in Vegas. Uh, you were you were talking up uh, Model Three. I so was. Is this going to be the the perfect accessory for your Model Three? Is that is? Are, are oh, you I mean, this this is the this is the Model Three of power banks. I mean, are you kidding me? It's it's an incredible. Uh, is, that, incredible is that a humongous compliment for the power bank, or is that a humongous <laughs> insult? <laughs> and it's not the just a power bank. It's the power bank monuments at their uh, studios or offices or something. So. This is this is supposed to be a tribute to their design prowess. The, uh, the thing I like better than this is they've also been selling a supercharger uh, station for your desk, where it doesn't actually charge anything. It it's uh it, it's a scale model of a supercharger, but it just holds your cables in place on your desk. There's there's no charging going on whatsoever. And they could even put in a USB port, something. <laughs> Just, I think it's also about fifty dollars, forty dollars, something like that. That so I understand it, especially in like they're trying to build the brand up as being some kind of lifestyle. You know, it, I I understand it, but this is the kind of thing that drives actual tech fans crazy, makes us sound like we're raging against companies when this is a company I wholeheartedly want to support. Um, our next car, I'm hoping, will be a Tesla, but. These kinds of moves drive me crazy. And then someone's going to buy, oh, Tesla, they make good products. I should buy this. Like, it's going to be an actual competitive product um, in this marketplace without doing any research when they're, what, Rav Power, Anchor, uh, Alki, uh, Xiaomi. My Xiaomi battery is badass. Um, there's so many other opportunities to, to, to actually fulfill this need um, that will be less expensive per milliamp hour capacity and uh we'll get the job done better for actual current smartphone and portable gadget hardware like if you had all the technology and you plugged it into a design a supercharger design and then priced it at 45 dollars, maybe i'll understand that but it's it's <laughs> the pure kind of contempt i feel for just here's a basic product with our design that's that our IP is worth so much uh, that you don't even understand it. And that's why it's $45. Hold on. I'm looking up on Amazon right now. I just want to get like, <laughs> I mean, I, I like, I had a thing on, you know, Jackery. I, that was like the first thing I saw for Amazon power banks. And uh, they had a similar so, design. So like the anchor power core 10,000. Um, high speed, compact, ten thousand milliamp hour battery, twenty five ninety nine. Oh wow! Rav Power, sixteen thousand seven hundred and fifty milliamp hour battery pack, dual port. So this is bigger. It's not going to be the same size, but twenty three ninety nine. Um, easy ACC. I actually have an easy ACC battery. It's badass. Twenty thousand milliamp hour charger, four amp, two port. 4.8 amp smart output high capacity power bank for iPads and other tablets, $33.99. I mean, that's, that's those are all okay options, but I don't think you'll get the the brush metal and the nylon and the, the woven treatment. Anchor but... Power Core Mini, 33, uh, 3350 milliamp hour lipstick sized aluminum <laughs> premium power bank. It's fourteen ninety nine. If it's not black with that red stripe and a little it's black gray. with a silver stripe, and it's smaller than a a lipstick container. This then tilt I, battery I, is pretty hefty, but it's twenty thousand milliamps, and it charges my MacBook Pro, fifty bucks. <laughs> well, I mean, I've got my my super heavy duty like actual like gaming laptop powering battery over there, and that that was closer to two hundred. So I'm not going to pull that. Guy out. <laughs> like uh yeah 20 bucks so and that fits nicely into my backpack and i get to charge my phone whenever i'm not using it while it's still in my backpack it's great 
So um, that's food for thought uh, this week. You can take that and run with it. Uh, and you can also see full details on these stories and more. You can hit pocketnow.com and look for the uh, podcast section to get to this episode's rundown. You can chat with us about what you, you've been reading up on with the hashtag PN Weekly. And also be sure to check out Jaime Rivera and the Pocket Now Daily on our YouTube channel. So we've got a bunch of tweets in here before we get to the sponsor block from Renato Laporte. Uh, the power bank, this Tesla power bank isn't even enough to charge a Huawei mate, LOL. But then he does like straight line emoticon face, like not really laughing, but we're laughing. Um, from David Brown, uh, PN Weekly, I take Lyft because I have an easier time communicating with their drivers. I think their drivers are higher quality and the ethics of the company don't match mine. I don't like the idea of them being sexist and covering things up like this, which I'm sure the second half of his tweet is relating to Uber. Uh, Andrew Wallace is uh, considering uninstalling Uber and installing Lyft. I I personally would probably support that kind of move. Um, and it. Dakota... And as does Hayato. So you've got the Hayato seal of approval. So it would be <laughs> foolish that. now not to do that thing that I just said. Uh, <laughs> we've got Dakota Lovejoy, PN Weekly. I did a speed test on my iPhone 10 running Net 10 cell service, and I got 43 megabytes where I live. I don't know where you live, though, Dakota, so I can't compare that against Andrew Wallace's amazing four megabit cricket connection. And uh, lastly, Andrew Wallace with a question. Did everybody get the Geekbench Pro app for free? It was, uh, it was free on Google Play for the last couple of days. You guys benchmarking with the, uh, the Geekbench? Is that what you're using? Sure yeah. am not. Benchmarking so hard right now. I'm benchmarking my laptop while holding this Hangouts uh, call. Well, I got it for free. I mean, free is free. So I was like, hey, I, I actually do occasionally use this. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and grab it. So I was yeah, still there. Yeah. There you go. So, hey, fun times for all, especially during Black Weekend, Black Week, Black some, something or other, sales, holidays, shopping. What the most wonderful time of the year? The most wonderful time of the year. This is true. But uh, what's what's not what doesn't make for a wonderful time of the year is when you go and you visit relatives and. They've got the high speed internets, which, you know, is usually like the base model plan for whatever cable carrier you're on with a router that's shoved under like a computer desk behind a planter surrounded by some sort of Faraday cage so that the Wi-Fi can make it about six inches away from the desk and no further. And you're trying to like play games with people or even just keep up with whatever fun tech stuff is going on. Uh, it was it was a, a kind of a dicey uh, couple hours in the uh, the Bagnell household this year when we were trying to install Cuphead on my gaming laptop because I forgot Ooh. to reinstall it. And uh, like I just had to plug in an Ethernet cable until we moved my parents' router out from underneath their desk. You know, uh, this week's sponsor actually has a solution that could help out with that. And uh, this this episode of the Pocket Now Weekly is brought to you by Eero. The single router Wi-Fi model just doesn't work for our increasingly high bandwidth world. What you need is a distributed system. You need a mesh system. You need Eero. Whatever your Wi-Fi needs, Eero has the power to seamlessly blanket your home in fast, reliable Wi-Fi with via Ethernet, wireless, or any combination. Simply set it on a flat surface, plug it into a wall outlet, and expand coverage to any room. Not to mention with the addition of a third 5 gigahertz radio on the second generation Eero, it's now tri-band and twice as fast as its predecessor, which lets, which lets customers do more in every room of their home simultaneously. And with the addition of a new thread radio, Eero can now connect to low power devices such as locks, doorbells, and other IoT home automation sensors. Meanwhile, Eero Beacon is half the size, but even more powerful than the original Eero. Whichever model you choose, with Eero's incredible customer support, you can call and get a hold of a Wi-Fi expert within 30 seconds. I actually published um, sort of a long-term look at using Eero in my own home I, I, you know, on my personal YouTube channel. That's not like smartphone and tablet related. Um, and mesh Wi-Fi has finally hit that point where the plug, plug and play, the ease of setup, the, the way that the app on a phone will help guide you through the setup and installation process. All of these things are now so much easier than 
The solutions we used to have with Wi-Fi range extenders or repeaters or power line options, having to try and figure out what circuit in your home you could use for power line. Eero took all of that away. I now have super fast Wi-Fi even out into my front yard. Um, and it was... Again, it was a tremendously easy setup. The only hitch was if you're running a ton of networked equipment. And in that case, you still might need to also have a secondary router to help with your wired connections. But everything else, Eero was baller to set up. And it was so painful going back to my parents' house and like going upstairs and then like, well, I, I have to go to LTE. Like there's like, I, I, my phone is now a, a useless lump in my pocket because I'm not getting any connection. So uh, for free overnight shipping to the US can or Canada, visit Eero.com, select overnight as the shipping option and enter pocket now at checkout. That's Eero.com, offer code pocket now at checkout. And we thank them for supporting the Pocket Now Weekly. Indeed we do. And uh, we also thank you for continuing to support the Pocket Now Weekly in the ways that you do. And one of those ways is by talking with us that's right we're gonna open up this month's monthly mailbag and uh, the first email that we shall go to comes from abdul wahab and uh, he writes hello there the lg v30 is one of the hottest phones of 2017 and a fair amount of hype is behind this phone but i saw the lg g6 in my area for 400 bucks and thankfully i was gifted the lg g6 and it is a great phone my question is, now that the LG G6 is around four or 500 bucks, does it make sense to get the V30 at almost double the price? Thanks for your efforts, Abdul Wahab. So uh, I want to hand it off to uh, the person who has the most experience with both phones, and that would be Juan. What do you think? Is, is the LG V30, I know that you know, you've dug into uh, the whole range of uh, issues and topics, and you don't want to just distill it down to price, but at the end of the day, someone's wallet's going to get thinner by this much. So that's your. Well, it, it's one of those things. So he was gifted in LG. I mean, make sure I got this right. He was gifted a G6. Yeah. Considering buying a V30, and he's worried about the price on a G6 versus the price on a V30. Is that because he? Might, I mean, he might want to sell it back on the market, and then right. So first of all. I don't think it's super likely you're going to get $400 for a used <laughs> Yeah, there you there go. There have been so many different sales on this thing, and they're pretty easy to get like great deals on new ones that you're, you're probably e not going to get much of a trade-in. So, so here's the deal, V30 to G6. Basically, every piece of the V30 is better than the G6, except, in my opinion, for some of the design. Some of the aesthetics. Really? I, I like that the camera sensor is flush on the G6. I like that the G6 has flat sides, which makes it easier to hold on to. I like that the G6 has a flat front face, which makes the screen protectors way easier to find and fit. Um, and that I personally like that the G6 is a little bit smaller. Every piece of the tech, though, is going to be a little bit better on the V30. Um, here in the United States, we didn't get the, the G6 with a DAC. I'm not sure if he got gifted the G6 Plus, which I believe does have the, the quad DAC. If it's not that version of the G6, then the V30 easily has better headphone audio. Um, the screen tech, you might like the screen tech better if you like OLEDs over LCDs. The processor is definitely a nice improvement if you're trying to do some gaming on your phone. Although if you're not doing any gaming, the Qualcomm 821 is going to do you just fine. Uh, and the camera on the V30 is a nice step up, even though it's the same sensor size. Moving over to that glass lens element definitely delivers improvements to photo quality. I just posted a photo of my daughter from the V30, we were riding in a bumpy shuttle to LAX. She was backlit, and I was able to use manual focus to nail focus on her eyelashes. And it's sharp. It's a great look. Um, so, you know, backlit toddler, and I got crystal clear focus on eyelashes. I could not have done that from any other phone. That's a V30 trick right there. Um, I would say take the free G6 and run it into the ground. That's my opinion. Um, use that to save up for next year's phones. And then, you know, you, you, I think you will be in store for a much more substantial upgrade going a full year cycle rather than the half, you know, the six month cycle of G6 to V30. What do you think, Hayato? 
I'm kind of in the same boat. I mean, if if we're just talking more general and just assuming that maybe, you know, he's not even talking about himself having the the free uh, G6, maybe just saying, you know, asking in general, is the G6 um, still, or I, I guess, is the V30 a better buy than the G6 at almost half or twice the price? It, for twice the money, it, it's really hard for me to recommend buying almost any phone uh, because the G6 <laughs> is already... G6 is already a pretty good phone, and right. I agree with you. The V30 is better in almost every way. V30 is one of my favorite phones of the year. I really, really yeah. enjoyed that thing. Um, but for double the cost, unless the unless manual video controls are really, really a high priority for you, I don't really think it's it's worth spending twice the money on. What do you think, Jules? Would you take the uh, the G6 in hand, or would you try and flip it and grab that V30? <sighs> I mean, if I had the, so if I were, were to assume maybe like a $200, $250 trade-in value, uh, then maybe I would uh, go for just biting off 600 bucks and just trying to see, or, well, yeah, 600 bucks or so, and playing around with something that might last me a little bit more because I, you know, I, I tend to think of these days as you know, games as zero sum, so that we're already starting off at a base level by just having the G6, you know, in our hands for free. Uh, and if we don't, if I don't feel that I'm getting the most out of it, if I'm not feeling that this might get the most, the best supports uh, come two years down the line, then I might just uh, figure that I've been hearing great things about the V30 and. Uh, uh, right. So, with- so in a vacuum, I agree with you, Jules, that like if you were buying the phone and you had the G6, you were looking at the V30 and you wanted the best sort of upgrade path, then I think the V30 would probably fit that bill. But, but you have a free G6 in your hand right now. Do you go to a phone that is a small step up in every tech bullet point this year or do you wait for a g7 or a v40 next year having ridden out that free phone for a little while because you don't care about like the operating system upgrade over one year you can flip it then probably still get close to 150 200 for it and look at next year's tech instead Mm. Uh, (laughs) I would be paying closer to full price for all those things after even more depreciation. On oh, the but after a point, the depreciation is going to bottom out. You know, like yeah. you, you can still you can still find like Note what? Four two hundred dollars. G six isn't going to retain its value that well, but you're still gonna, still probably going to get around one hundred and fifty two hundred for it. I, mean, as a no, part- I, I like imagining it's just going to keep on going exponentially down, and one day the G six like <laughs> next year will just be like twenty bucks on Swappa. No, yeah. Or, or it, it's it's like a limit curve, you know. It just keeps inc- yeah. increasingly approaching zero, it but it never quite gets to zero. Curve, as opposed to this opposite limit limit curve that everyone else seems to be on, LG is like this. So I mean, it's it's I mean, it depreciates fast from the beginning, and it just seems to bottom up er, uh, earlier than everyone else. So. Yeah. Uh, so that, Andrew Wallace yeah. sent us a, a, a chart on from Swappa that uh, G sixes are currently going for two forty five if they're T Mobile, two fifty if they're Sprint, two eighty five on Verizon, and three hundred for the AT and T variant. So on AT and T, I would be willing to say I would eat fifty to a hundred dollars of current value on the G6 to shop next year's phone. That would be my recommendation. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting recommendation. Uh, of course, Abdul, it's yours to decide. Uh, hopefully we helped you out just a little bit here. Uh, I want to move on to Wilson Ong next, who has a question about uh, the HTC U11 Plus and... Oh. Uh, I feel like we're going to have a very quick answer to that, but I think this gives us some opportunity to talk about the U11 Plus. I don't think we have just yet. Uh, I've been a long, avid listener, he says, to the podcast and even uh, an even longer reader of the Pocket Now site since the Windows Mobile days. My question is, will the Pocket Now team be reviewing the HTC U11 Plus? I especially look forward to Juan's real audio review of that U11 Plus. Well, hi, Ada. What do you think about Pocket Now reviewing the... Uh... 
<laughs> I'm sorry, you're on this mailbag uh, where we're not throwing to you at all on this stuff. Um, do we even have a U11 Plus in-house? I know we did a hands-on with it. I don't have one. I think I may spend time with it. On the record here, but I think uh, we might be able to procure one if we had to. Well, yeah, I mean, literally, we could just go out and buy one, too, even though our end-of-the-year budget's fairly well exhausted at this point. Um, I am probably not going to be doing any special coverage like a camera or audio review on the U11+. Plus. Um, first of all, I don't believe it's changed significantly. The audio side of it has changed significantly since the U11, which hasn't changed significantly since the Bolt. Um, and it's a situation I've been pretty disapp disappointed when with HTC. Formally, I think the top Android manufacturer supporting audio, I think they've lost that crown and I've not been impressed with their solutions. Uh, Hyatt, have you spent any time with a U11 Plus? No, I wish I had because honestly, that's the phone that uh, if I were buying a new one right now, that would be my top pick. I think it's absolutely gorgeous and uh, really, really like it. But no, I, I uh, Alex Doby, the um, our, our UK editor over at Android Central, got to mess around with it a little bit for a hands-on. But um, no, no, no hands-on time for me. So wow. I, I I look at the U11 Plus and just especially after spending time with Google's split pixel strategy. And that looks like the phone that Google should have released. Uh, yeah, it just it. There's something about HTC manufacturing that you can't really get an aesthetic like that anywhere else. The U11 is a fine phone. It's not really a phone for me, but I could totally see where that phone could have blown up huge in the market if people had known that it, it existed. And I think HTC is yeah. in the same boat here with the U11 Plus with a really limping strategy into getting this phone out in the market. Yeah. 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 I mean, we're, we're talking about something that is has been the evolution, has been the natural evolution towards... Uh, the U11, and also kind of the Pixel uh, line, and it just, it's still stuck under this HTC attitude of, uh, let's just give this to Europe and uh, nowhere else. Um, and that's pretty much it. I don't, th I don't think they're taking America too seriously, which is a shame. Yeah, uh, I mean, when I was, when I was working at T-Mobile, I was always trying to tell people to buy the HTC 10, uh, but they pulled that off the shelves after three months or so. Yeah. Uh, never got the U11 over at T-Mobile. And I mean, you know, obviously nobody's getting the U11 Plus in America. So U.S. strategy has been a little weak lately. Well, and, and I can kind of understand why. It seems like every major carrier has been burned in some way by HTC mm -hmm. not continuing the conversation for them. Uh, yeah. For, for AT&T, it seemed like AT&T pulled out of the HTC game after the 1A9 is a terrible mid-ranger strategy for HTC. If anyone was going to try and do an iPhone clone, it, it should not have been HTC. Um, and then Sprint, I believe it was one of the, the last Evo or Maxes where they started sort of fizzling on, uh, on HTC as a, as a carrier solution. And I, and I think Verizon sort of had it with um, HTC after the Windows phone uh, M M8 sort of yeah. didn't do anything mm -hmm. either. And and consistently, every single generation of HTC phone has had less user engagement, less fan base, um, less advertising, less conversation. And yet they still keep putting out phones, expecting people to pick them up and buy them. And I, I do not for the life of me understand um, how, how any part of HTC is still functional in North America right now. Yeah, I don't either. It's it's a bummer for me because I've, I've always had a soft spot for HTC. That was like my, my very first Android phone was uh, mm -hmm. the HTC Inspire on at t just their, their sort of uh, Evo port. And uh, yeah, I really want HTC to do well, but they're, they're just not. Well, and yeah. I can take it all the way back to, I mean, because I'm old. Um, I can take it all <laughs> the way back to like HTC is the supplier for every Windows mobile device that I absolutely loved. And there's a part of that culture, there's a part of that DNA that I don't think they were ever able to truly shake. So even when they started branding their own devices, like the HTC Diamond, um, I don't know, they, they just never put the same effort into communicating their existence to consumers. They hit a high point with the 1M7. That phone was gorgeous. 
especially for its time. And then since then, they've just sort of been coasting and you can't you can't grow. You can't build. You can't fulfill a market and compete against Apple and Samsung in any meaningful way if that's how you're going to handle the customer conversation. No, not at all. Which and I, I, you know, leaving them like this, I don't know how long. It's it's been a question that we've been asking. How long will they survive another year? Like that's, and how much does Vive really matter at this point? Because we keep talking about this as this up and coming uh, VR platform for them, and they're one of the, if not the most popular uh, platform out there. But it's just, it's not making them enough money to keep the balance books alive so so we have a couple other tweets coming in uh backtracking just a bit for uh the g6 question from david batista at this point wouldn't it be better just to wait three months for the g7 announcement from peter hayton i'm guessing if you already have a g6 it will probably do you fine until the next v series phone unless you really could use the camera benefits on the v30 and ed modlin stick with what you have i'm sure it's a short time before something not iterative a bigger jump will show up and then Ed also throws in a couple other tweets about HTC. Uh, PN Weekly, you mean you as in usual bull? <laughs> and it's bad when even Metro PCS stops selling HTC. Well, that's because they haven't been putting out the Desire things. And they only put out yeah. one the Desire 555. And uh, that hasn't been really getting as so good. Tell me, tell me why you're wrong that the U11 is a great phone. <laughs> I, I will say, you know, one of the things that I loved during this is so silly. One of the things that I loved about the U11 because I haven't held the U11 Plus because um, I hate selfie cameras. I hate them. They're they're terrible, lower quality cameras. The good cameras on the back of the phone get good at taking your selfies from the back camera. It's the better camera. So, so the V30 so easy on the U11. <laughs> That mirror finish it was so yeah. simple to line up an awesome selfie shot. The whole back of your phone was helping you out. That was the nice thing about the Xperia XZ1 Premium, too. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. That was maybe the shiniest back of a phone I've ever seen. I mean, the, the least practical. And, and again, I have a hard time. I love Note 4 or V10 style phones. I like metal edges and grippy backs. Um, yeah. BlackBerry, the BlackBerry Key 1. That's, that's my like grown-up phone of the year this year. Um, so a jewel tone phone, not for me, but damn, it was easy <laughs> nailing those those rear camera selfies. Yeah, yeah, man, those selfies. God, well, one of those ways that uh, those selfies get to, to uh, all the people out there is through the internet. And I feel like uh, we owe Hanson, the band Hanson, no, sorry, uh, Hanson from Bye. Singapore uh, <laughs> with uh, this tweet here. Well, I'm not sure if you guys have talked about net neutrality yet, but if you haven't, can you talk about it briefly, please? Uh, I have not got the full picture since I'm not from the U.S., and it's fair to ask this question since a lot of uh, people who don't uh, aren't in the U.S. and are more used to their already existing structures to pay for the Internet uh, are just uh, kind of... Um, I mean, we've been seeing a whole bunch of examples outside of the U.S. from Portugal and New Zealand, where they and have Chile, yeah, and Chile, where they have a, a different structure here. We'll get to that in a second, but um, uh, I well, I think Juan would be the most versed in doing. Actually, I, I kind of want to. I want to throw to Hayato first on this one because oh, sure. I've, I've been known to soapbox on a lot of this stuff too, and. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think a lot of people are kind of feeling a little exhausted by this conversation. This is the yeah. third very public round of people trying to support this policy that the government keeps trying to find some way of doing away with. Um, what are what are your feelings on the current state of the conversation surrounding net neutrality? Uh, I sure wish we didn't have to keep having this conversation. I wish. Uh, yeah, it, it's such an such a ridiculous thing to me at least that this is still an ongoing debate um but you know it, it it's there's all these all these uh companies just that keep on telling us you know oh don't worry we're not going to you know the the, the service providers like comcast or or you know phone providers like verizon they keep on saying we're not going to you know change anything about the way that we distribute content to you we support net neutrality and so on. And, and, you know, they've shown historically, no, they don't, they, you know, they absolutely don't. They've already pretty much every company that has said this kind of thing has been caught um, in the past, you know, 
slowing down certain services, uh, banning them altogether. Um, I think it was pretty well known that I think it was Verizon and AT&T that, um, that completely blocked Google Wallet for a mm -hmm. while to um, try and because compete they, with. Because they, 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 uh, they founded ISIS. Right. <laughs> Don't forget, AT&T and Verizon are the, the founding members of ISIS. So. Yeah, <laughs> the founding members of ISIS, which became the, the, the nice and soft title of soft card because... I, I don't know what would be a worse name. Oh, I, oh, I wasn't talking about the terrorist organization. <laughs> I was talking about the mobile payment solution, ISIS, that AT&T and Verizon created. They created ISIS. I personally think soft card is a worse... Oh, I'm not talking about the spy organization in the fictional uh, television show Archer. I'm talking about the mobile payment solution that AT&T and Verizon, they created ISIS. That's all I'm saying. I don't want to go too deeply without uh, just giving a one minute uh, wrap because this person from Singapore is asking the question here. So basically our legislation, uh, the Communications Act that the FCC uh, has, is operating under, uh, says that uh, Title II, if they had this law that says that no, all connections are equal and that people pay a single set price for that connection. And uh, for a while, under this uh, 2015 open internet order, uh, the internet, internet service was protected under Title II, and you couldn't throttle certain traffic, you couldn't block certain sites, you couldn't do that, it was illegal. And, uh, you know, there was a regulation to enforce that. And, you know, prior to that, you know, it was already, you know, it was kind of a, a light, touch regulatory thing. That's one of uh, Chairman Ajit Pai's favorite phrases, light touch regulatory approach, uh, which uh, you know, has existed for a long time. But even then, one of the main concerns about this was that, um, you know, the competition uh, has, al has always been lacking in terms of uh, the telco industry, because AT&T and Verizon would have the this market over here and that market over here, and neither none of the two would uh, meet. They would all have their own market. So in many places, only one option for internet service would be provided. And therefore, if one of the companies blocked sites or slowed down traffic for one reason or another, uh, they would have no one, no one else to turn to and they would have to live with that. So uh, that's been, always been the concern. Um, one of the arguments against it, uh, Ajit Pai has always said is that, oh, they're, they, they, we can't expand our networks and uh, we can't you know, grow into the rural population and whatnot. So uh, this is why we need to kill Title II. We need to end this. And um, even though the Comcast and a whole bunch of other uh, companies have said that this Title II production doesn't do anything in terms of uh, their profit lines, that it doesn't affect them, uh, affect them negatively. And you know they have to tell the truth because they're reporting to investors. They, this is still happening. This this vote is still happening. The order has been suggested, and uh, now it's going up for a vote on December fourteenth. So um, to kill Title II or not for internet, that is the main subject that we're talking about here. So I, I think it's pretty clear we're all in support of keeping some kind of Title II regulation of broadband in place. I uh, I've yet to see any compelling evidence that removing Title II regulations will be a good thing for the internet. And this is clouded by a lot of really pithy and really uh, sort of uh, overly simplified conversations. People, I, people have left comments on some of my personal videos talking about how, oh, we don't want to make this like net neutrality is a black and white issue and blah, 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 blah. We don't want to um, make it overly simplistic. But when we look at the the opposition to Title II, a lot of it is built on, at best, ignorance, or at worst, a directed misinformation campaign designed to confuse what's actually happening. And so part of the, part of the reason why this FCC strategy is so successful is the blurring of lines between the definitions of a telecommunication service and an information service. And at times, the internet will function as both. But a telecommunication service, as defined by Congress, 
is a service which transmits information of the user's choosing to and from endpoints specified by the user without making any changes to that user's information. So, so you send an email from jules at pocketnow.com to juan at pocketnow.com. Well, hold on, Jules. Oh. So, so what I'm talking about are literally the packets that form the backbone of the internet. Now, an information service has a much broader definition. Uh, oh. The offering of a capability for generating, acquiring, storing, transforming, processing, retrieving, utilizing, or making available information via telecommunications. So that's why the FCC has been granted, I mean, through the courts, the FCC has been granted a lot of leeway as to what they're classifying as what. And there are plenty of, of uh, examples of where the internet can fulfill both of those definitions. But the regulation that we're interested in has nothing to do with the content on the internet because we are trying to classify the internet as a telecommunication service. So that's literally trying to regulate the on-ramps to the to the uh, internet, not what cars can go on the internet, not what destination you can choose on the internet has nothing to do. So if someone says, oh, I don't want the government picking my winners and losers, then they fundamentally don't understand what this regulation is trying to protect people from. That's that's the major part of this problem. And that's why IGF Pi is able to muddy the waters by classifying the inter the internet as an information service solely and not looking at the FCC's regulatory powers when it comes to the parts of the internet which should be regulated as a telecommunications service. And this is where we really got to go into the weeds a little bit. And we have to reassure people, the government isn't going to be able to say, oh, I don't like Facebook, so let's ban it. That The FCC doesn't have that kind of authority, and that's not the kind of regulation they're going after. But if we allow the internet to be classified as an information service, then Verizon and Comcast and other ISPs and other carriers can decide for you how expensive it is to go to individual sites or services on the internet. Why it's go to YouTube when you can use our streaming service on Comcast, Xfinity? Or why you know utilize this cloud storage solution when you can use our, our Xfinity cloud bucket? So this is one of the major conflicts in having a, an organization which controls the pipe or the road to the internet and is also responsible for providing content on the internet. And that's a huge conflict of interest. It's a conflict of interest when you have Google Fiber and Google services, and it's a conflict of interest when you have Time Warner or Comcast or Spectrum or Verizon and Comcast, Time Warner, Verizon and Spectrum services. So this, this is why having some small way of uh, accountability built into the system is so vital to the future of growth because it's the only way that smaller upstarts can actually compete on the main stage and not just get completely swallowed up by every 800 pound gorilla in the room. Well, and there's, and it really comes down to who becomes the gatekeeper of the internet because at this point it's still the user. It's still, you know, whoever they can track your data, but they can't, manipulate you to go to direct uh, redirect sites or whatnot and they can't block well and this is also why why jules are like why that phrase gatekeeper of the internet is so important because i think a lot of people take that to mean gatekeeper of the internet then google will tell me i mean uh, the government will tell me that i can't use google and i have to use bing and that's not what this <laughs> what this regulation will allow uh, the FCC to do. And we also have to take into account that the AC FCC is a fairly small and fairly underfunded regulatory agency that Title II is really only going to be uh, a reactive regulatory uh, situation. So an ISP is not only going to have to violate the tenets of Title II, but do so so egregiously that consumers complain. And even then, the FCC is, has limited resources to actually go after a Verizon or a Comcast. So these fights are going to be few and far between, but we have real accountability. Look at this current administration. We elected conservatives, and now conservatives are trying to gut net neutrality. The government is actually responding to the vote from the people. However, if corporations are in charge of what you can access or how you can access it, what kind of influence do you have over a corporation? You, you, are you going to lobby shareholders? Are you going to lobby CEOs? 
how do you how do you actually affect change at a corporation level when their main responsibility is to provide value and profit to shareholders, not to listen to the will of the people using their services? So this is another major aspect of who do we want having that kind of influence over the connection we use to get to the internet, not the content we consume on the internet. Well, I want to go into what the post picture would look like, because if this vote goes through, it's a three Republican, two Democrat uh, board on the FCC. So it's likely that this will go through and what will happen. So they're going to do uh, a regular transparency reports uh, and uh, just say what they've done in the past, however many days uh, that they've done. And, the, you know, and that's, you know, and, what the most important thing about that was that GPI says that um, if there's any litigation that needs to be involved and, you know, people think that's not right, then the Federal Trade Commission would uh, handle it all, uh, which I think is kind of a sham that even with the under, you know, the reality of the FCC being underfunded and whatnot, it had the authority to actually go through and, you know, it had defined terms of what it looked out, uh, what it should look out for and what it should enforce. We don't have those terms, and the FTC, if it does, does decide to do, act on anything in terms of a suit, we'd have to go through fact-finding missions and deciding what's this and what's that and what's fair is fair. So in terms of protecting the companies from uh, harmful lawsuits that uh, you know, let the consumers have a say in what they want, um, it's just going to be a more confusing process than what is already a confusing process. Well, and also there are significant different. Th I mean, like we we don't have the the bandwidth or the uh, the time to get into a deep in the weeds discussion on the difference between the FTC and the FCC. But there are significant differences in how they would handle cases of abuse and how they can set policy and how they can respond to the market and their relationship to Congress and the Senate. And there are some arguments to be made for the FTC getting involved in consumer abuse situations. I can I can definitely see the situation coming from people who are more libertarian leaning, because ultimately I would prefer having a more libertarian approach to the Internet. However, if we just flip the switch today, there will be no more competition in this space. It will be more uh, an exercise in consolidation, especially given the FCC's recent track record in making it even easier for media outlets to uh, consolidate. And this was another thing that kind of flew under the headlines. It was uh, oh, two yeah. weeks ago, we could, right we before could, Thanksgiving week. We could talk about they, they abolished a 42-year-old rule on preventing one media conglomerate from owning like all of the newspapers and TV stations and radio stations in a local area. So that's gone now, too, in light of this move towards gutting uh, net neutrality. This is why the FCC will be more effective, in my opinion, in managing the situation and owing to Title II regulations. And for anyone who's concerned, this would be similar re uh, regulatory uh, practice as what we see for things like telephone companies and cell carriers. It was only through regulation that we actually got improvements to competition. And that was, you know, it was divestiture. And again, you can read up on breaking up mom, pa, bell. Um, <laughs> The, the current situation that we find ourselves in today, I feel, is analogous. It's a clumsy analogy, but it's still a functional analogy to the situation we find ourselves in today. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff that's happening. But ultimately, my prediction is uh, December 14th is going to roll around. The FCC currently holds a three to two uh, conservative majority because you swing the FCC to support the administration that's in power. And I'm pretty confident that this vote is going to go their way because they've got the three to two majority. And then what we'll see afterwards is a prolonged and costly funded by taxpayers legal battle that'll probably take another five years in the courts, just like the original OIO did, the open Internet order, which, again, that's all coming out of taxpayers pockets. And uh, we're going to have to deal with that all because the uh, the FCC has been captured by these uh, these major media companies. So that's what I see. I, I'm hoping that we can get a stay or some kind of injunction that prevents the immediate gutting of Title II regulation, and that can stay long enough to eventually get the Trump administration out of office. So that's that's my, if I were betting and I were playing Vegas odds, that's what I imagine is probably going to happen over the next month. So one of the weird uh, things that has come out of this is all the pointing out of uh, how 
other countries do their internet. Now, to be fair, uh, what we've seen on all these are just uh, uh, in, like um, uh, uh, mobile internet service uh, and not just uh, wireline internet service, home internet, like that. Uh, but in many places, they have packages for data for messaging. Like you can have a- unlimited access to these apps, to WhatsApp, Skype, whatever, for four ninety nine a month, and that's just access to those services. The apps are free, and and it's just it, it'd be weird um, to see that if spread out to the U.S. in you know, for home service, if they wanted to, if the com- if the companies wanted to charge per app for access to that site, or it's just that's um, that's the implications of uh, well, and these these aren't hypothetical. There are plans like this that are in effect in parts of the world right now. So uh, it, I know a lot of people like to come like, oh, well, what you're talking about is a mobile plan and not a landline or something. You're like that doesn't matter. <laughs> like, that's right. literally Same. not driving. The concept spread across everything that we have. Yeah. So, I, I mean, yeah. So that's the fight we're up against at this moment. Um, and, and I mean, we're going to go down the line. I know you talk about, you know, it, it's, this is taxpayer funded. Well, we, we run the government and we're, we pay to live here and uh, we're kept alive. Oh, I, I, I mean, I appreciate the fact that it's taxpayer. What I'm frustrated is we're having this fight yet again on the taxpayer's dime. We've we've demonstrated numerous times over over successive generations of this debate that this is the people who are paying attention and the people that I feel you should listen to. This is what we want. And the FCC has has actually been stymieing the ability to investigate things like Russian collusion or whether or not bots were impersonating real people during this last public round of commenting. The FCC did nothing to actually safeguard their commenting process and claimed they had a DDoS attack that that hasn't. Um, that they haven't been able to provide any evidence for. So none of this has been communicated in good faith, and they've been obstructing uh, citizens' inquiries into what's actually gone down. So again, I feel the FCC has become a captured agency in the grand scheme of regulations. Made all the more frustrating by the fact that, you know, up until 2015... Uh, taxpayers have been on the hook for 400 billion in network fees and subsidies and charges to the major telecoms that was originally supposed to go towards rolling out fiber that was going to be the backbone of our energy grid and our future telecommunications network and none of that's really materialized except in areas where consumers have set up their own local broadband or in areas where google fiber is available to consumers that's been the only appreciable rollout on a $400 billion multi-decade investment, again, on the taxpayer dime. So I'm kind of I'm kind of overplaying this game. Uh, I, I do I do still recommend that people make their voices heard. You still communicate with your local elected officials and your state representatives, because it's only through that kind of support that we'll we'll see any kind of campaign to oppose the uh, striking Title II in the courts. If they don't hear that conversation, then there's not going to be a lot of uh, a lot of pressure on lawmakers and on lawyers to try and fight that fight. And again, I, I want to throw this one out there to Maine. Um, who is it? Senator Collins in Maine was the first Republican senator to stand out against uh, removing Title II restrictions. She's the first one to break from her party. And I want to throw her a big thumbs up. Senator Collins and I disagree on numerous um, policy, but. If you really do believe in small business, if you really do believe in the future of our economy and you really do believe in the United States maintaining some kind of position as a leader in telecommunications, there is no good argument I can find for removing Title II protections. And she seems to uh, respect and understand that. So thumbs up, Senator Collins, Republican out of Maine. I think you're on the right path and I hope more of your ilk will join you in this debate. Hey, Hayato, do you want to go to Maine sometime? <laughs> uh, it's not particularly on my travel list, but sure. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk the whole of New England together. This is going to be great. Yeah, so uh, I think Maine Boston is sometime. where I've had the best, uh, the best lobster roll I've ever eaten was in Maine. You're going to have a great ton of lobster and clam. Clam bakes. They're going to be nice. 
Mm. Well, that was that was fun. We should probably wrap the show up on a few other comments and questions. Yeah, here. Daniel Milanov, my first smartphone was the HTC Wildfire. Later moved on to the 1M7. Loved that phone so much. Currently waiting for a signal wire for it since I might have killed it. Yeah, that's... If, if a company were to do a throwback phone with current specs, Juan, your pick. Uh, oh, a throwback phone with current specs? Um, it, this is a toss-up. I would either vote for a Note 4 or a Moto X2 with the same kind of like leather back, uh, customizable Moto Maker kinds of uh, additions. My Moto X2 is still one of my all-time favorite phones to hold. <laughs> and my Note 4, I think, is still one of the best phones ever made. So still so salty about that uh, Moto X2 not getting the update to Marshmallow. Super salty about that, especially because I've got the, I have that AT&T version that never did officially get like any significant upgrades on it. And um, it's such a beautiful little phone. It's like almost within arm's reach right now. <laughs> so far, but yet so, so close. I'm going to go get it. I'm going to go get it. Is there any, <laughs> any excuse to touch and fondle and molest my Moto X2? I mean, you can do that on screen while Hayato tells us more. I'm, I'm trying to get to you, Hayato. Well, I mean, sorry not to sorry to not mix it up much, but Moto X2 is going to be my answer as well. That was my really? favorite phone design. Uh, I think the Nexus 6 was kind of like a revitalized Moto X2, but it was just not the same uh, feel to me, at the same level oh, of quality, and and oh, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't it wasn't as uh, customizable, and that's that's something that has has unfortunately gone away with the Moto X series. You know, the Moto X4, there's no Moto Maker; you get two color options. Both the glass. Um, and I loved my Moto X2. Pure Edition wasn't the same. So uh, yeah. there it is. Yeah. <sighs> I always you wanted to do some uh, ASMR where you can like hear me rubbing against my beard. Oh, geez. This is. Oh, that's good. That's good. Shut up, Jules. They need to hear me rubbing against my beard. God. Shut up, Jules. <gasps> Stop breathing, Jules. It's ASMR. <laughs> Hi, you're ruining it. Okay. Well, we're not gonna get it. Uh, anyone who wanted to hear like that really great ASMR beard rub, you 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 don't have it because these guys are making a bunch of noise. But yeah. still, I'll like, save that for a different video. Ethically gorgeous. I mean, it's still yeah. a flipping gorgeous phone today. I would love to have modern internals. When you think about like yeah. the smaller bezels, the uh, the dual space. It doesn't have the chin speaker. This is a, this is just a dummy space that could have been functional, but. Even in this world of 18 by nine, <laughs> two by one aspect ratio screens, like this phone still holds up phenomenally well in terms of yeah. design and aesthetics. I'd love to have the rear fingerprint sensor, put on a slightly better camera module, get rid of the terrible old Moto camera app for what they're using today. And this would be a baller competitor. And I love how the leather has aged. It's gotten yeah. a little darker. It's gotten all marked up and kind of creased, and it just looks worn. It doesn't look all scratched and gross like glass and aluminum. <laughs> yeah, the, the the leather on the back of the Moto X2 is what I wanted the G4 to feel like, and it just yeah. didn't. It, it wasn't quite the same. Although, you know what was close? The the brown leather. I had the right hand feel. It just didn't look right. But the um the burgundy, there was an oxblood leather back that looked. Yeah epic on the g4 but it aged really poorly um which was a shame <laughs> like the corners would get worn out and then you'd see that plastic base underneath really quickly and then ah, that looks kind of gross whereas this just looks awesome as it's gotten yeah better. It keeps getting it keeps looking better man i would I, i'm stuck between the htc 1s and the the 1m8s because I, i've like when i the first thing i saw Back in 2012, when they had the 1S, was that video where they did the black uh, backplating and that like ironization, and it looked so cool, and I just wanted to touch that thing. So that that's you know I still want a 1S just with yeah. new specs and uh, with the 1M8. I mean, it's just the standard great, uh, uh, you know, metal slab, thin profile, and just you know, it just slid e easily in and out. Nice brushed metal. And it had two camera ports uh, for its, uh, ch you know, using. So imagine what HTC could do again with a uh, strategy like, well, yeah, they're returning to it next year. So we're, we're going to have to see what HTC does next year. But if that works out pretty well, I would want that on the 1M8. 
on from Renato Laporte. He he wants the Lumia 920 in yellow back, which I guess, Ooh, I actually I've got mine right over there. It's almost within arm's reach. I'm gonna go get it. Any excuse to fondle and molest my <laughs> nine It's extending this podcast to new lengths, man. If they if they made the nine twenty again, but with with, uh, with with Android Oreo, I'd be all over it. Maybe a little bigger. David Batista De Silva, Nokia Lumia ten twenty, but with Android and Micro SD. Uh, don't like it. I've got, I've got my Lumia ten twenty right over there. It's within arm's reach. Just any now I'm not gonna keep doing it. Do not the, look. The, the the blue nine twenty though was just one the of my cyan. favorite looking phones. Yeah, the matte finished cyan Lumia nine twenty is still like one of my unicorn phones. I need to get. Yeah, it. that was that was an outstanding looking phone. Oh, it's so good. Man, oh, man. So like clean, and that camera was so ahead of its time. I mean, I know the ten twenty took it to like a, a like a crazy level in terms of camera tech, but the nine twenty camera was. Yeah phenomenal too and it was built like a tank you could you could bludgeon somebody with it well and that it was super easy it's it's these two torque screws yeah get to everything <laughs> on the inside of your phone i mean you know it doesn't have like the removable back but i bet you i could still get uh, a replacement battery for this and refresh it just not have like current software to go with it because microsoft sucks and i hate them right now um, the, uh, the Ed Modlin actually has a question for us here on Twitter using the PN weekly hashtag. Uh, hi, Otto. When do you think Sony will actually work with a U.S. carrier again before hmm. the app, the rapture or after like, will we have to have like a significant portion of the population evacuated into heaven <laughs> before Sony will do business with another U.S. carrier? It's, you know, it's, it's pretty likely. Yeah. Um, whenever they do it, just please don't put another phone in the US unless it has a fingerprint sensor, please. <laughs> I, I absolutely adore the little XZ1 compact. Oh, except me too. for the fact that it pisses me off that I have to use like <laughs> some sort of pattern unlock on that phone. Yeah, like yeah, Z like ZTE has ZTFO. a thing. Yeah, ZTE has a thing. Might, might, you might want to try and see if you can uh, latch onto their patent instead, instead of having to deal with whatever license uh, BS thing that you yeah. have to deal with whatever uh and uh, i think in terms of that if it barring that maybe i mean they've been redeveloping their brand so that they're targeting more high-end stuff and that's getting more towards the carrier's taste so i would hope to say sooner rather than later we might see sony back again Although for, for what it's worth, um, when I worked at T-Mobile, was there for four years and we sold multiple Sony phones. I think in my stores, we moved maybe five a year. So <laughs> That sounds five like million. a high end. I think you yeah. might be creating that number there. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, well. I don't know. So um, the, the last question that we've got here on the Twitter that I want to get to, and I want to throw this one to you too, Hayato. Uh, this is from Andrew Wallace. They've heard me uh, pontificate on this question a number of times, so I'm not even going to weigh in on this podcast. But uh, Andrew's asking you, Hayato, what is your pa personal favorite implementation of a dual lens camera on a smartphone in 2017? Do you like Boom. zooms? Do you like the match sensor? Do you like the ultra wide on the LG? The OnePlus 5T. No, I'm just kidding. That's yeah. no. <laughs> Um, so I'm one of those weird guys that uh, I, pretty much everybody else seems to like the, the wide angle lenses and they're, they're fun for what they're worth, but I prefer having, uh, having a telephoto lens. Um, the one on the OnePlus 5 that I use is not the best, um, but especially on the Note 8, I really, really loved having an optically stabilized second camera uh, with zoom. It was really, really nice. Um, I had this discussion on a, on a podcast uh, last week where even if... Sometimes, I mean, even with the OnePlus 5, even though the second camera is probably not going to be as good as, as the main camera, even when you're zooming in digitally, um, I feel better not digitally zooming. I feel like even if, even if the quality is worse, it feels like it's going to be better to me. You hipster photographer nerd, you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I've been trained over the years to, to viscerally not want to use the, um, the you know, to, digital to use digital zoom. zoom. Yeah. 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 So I like having an optical zoom with, with the with the lens or I mean maybe not optical zoom but just optical uh, a, a closer focal range. I mean you're wrong, but it's okay. <laughs> We're still friends. 
I guess. You know, you know the nice thing about a telephoto lens, it doesn't bow. Your shot doesn't bow. <laughs> That's true. Ooh. Yeah, no, I I don't know. I So while we could fight over this uh for the Oh, long... I wanted to fight over it. Go ahead, Jules. You want to go ahead? <laughs> oh yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm just going to make an argument for the color, like the color mono thing, because yeah. more pixels, uh, more chances to like do crop in at a high detail, and uh, yeah, you don't have to zoom, so or move back, or do anything, and just stand right there and uh, take your picture like a normal person. Actually, I'm gonna, Hi, I'm gonna yeah, revise. Right? I'm going to revise my statement and say my favorite dual camera setup is the Pixel 2 that negates the need for a dual camera setup. It doesn't, though. It's no. really good. But I still, I still like, really I, I, think, I think matched monochrome and color sensors is, are still my favorites for they, they are. sensor implementation. Yeah, they, they are very good. And so I posted, a, I'll actually, I'll, I'll put up the results now. So there's a, there was a tweet. I don't know if I still have it pinned. I shouldn't have, ha have kept it pinned for an entire week. That would have been bad Twitter etiquette on my part. But on the, uh, the Pocket Now Twitter, I put up two photos indoors using uh, portrait modes. And so one of them is super sort of close and it looks super cropped in and grainy and looks awful. And the other one, no, I don't have it pinned. We have something else pinned that's also super old that we probably should unpin by now. Um, <laughs> if you go to the Pocket Now Twitter, you can see. And so it was the uh, the Galaxy Note 8 versus the Huawei Mate 10. And the difference is remarkable in portrait mode indoors. I mean, it is lit. It's just lit by one lamp across the room. It's so lit. And so and it, it's kind of terrible, like how how much light gets, how restrictive the uh, the little zoom sensors are when it comes to uh, getting more light on the sensor. So, uh, mm. and the fact that it doesn't crop. So the the pixel I think is is better. The computational uh, setup is better than a zoom sensor if you're looking at portrait mode. But I still think the the matched color and uh, monochrome sensors are the best competitors for that kind of an effect. It's lit AF. True. It's hella lit. It's oh, hella actually, lit. I've got them on my desktop. I can I can pull up the photos here. Here, <laughs> give me one second, and I'll go into a screen share. Oh, uh, you, you, you got to pull up the watching. pictures and and show us the rainbow swirls of the Dairy Queen. So that's the uh, uh, that's the Mate 10, and again, it's portrait mode, so it looks all weird and cut out and artificially enhanced. But this is the exact same distance, the exact same lighting taken less than a minute apart from the Note 8. Woof. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> so the Note 8 in good light is going to do a better job with zoom because the Mate 10 uses that sort of uh, interpolated high resolution. It's trying to do the zoom f trick from the Lumia 1020. It just doesn't have as much resolution to work with. But when you're talking portrait modes, like that's epic, especially considering like all of the vents and stuff in the background. Um, like that's that's a pretty, a pretty a uh, pretty decent representation of that shot. And again, from the same lighting, this is the best that the note could pull off. I mean, the uh, the attractiveness of the subject notwithstanding, maybe <laughs> Samsung was just trying to block my face as much as possible. Uh, I just avoid taking selfies. Well, but I mean, it's also like if you're really going to use a portrait mode, you're going to want to use it in other places other than like perfect sunset lit, you know, beautiful background locations. You might occasionally want to try a portrait I mode. I mean, I could God. freaking take a picture. No, hold on, hold on. Oh, boy. We're going to have a crossover here. Uh, so, hi, Adam. So what was your something. favorite side dish this, this Thanksgiving season? My favorite oh my side dish. You know what? I made corn casserole for the first time, and it turned oh, nice. out what actually did, what really good. What did you good. use? Because I do a corn and broccoli casserole. It was, uh, you yeah, know, just corn. Uh, what was it? Sour cream. Uh, oh, okay, you went. You went that route. Yeah, yeah. So it's I pretty, do. Pretty I, I now because we, we've gotten all hipstery with it. So I do. Uh, I make my own cream corn. Um, I use fresh broccoli. We mix that up with just a little bit of egg, some onion. Uh, I like a lot of black pepper. I just, I, I don't. Oh, like I do too. Salt. 
you crumble up some Ritz crackers on the top of that. You bake that 350 for about 40 minutes, and it's pretty delicious. Oh, boy. I mean, it's pretty. Like, look look at that. Look at that portrait. I, mean, I don't I, it's <laughs> Google Hangouts, man. We're not going to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Ever, Jules, we're we're not gonna see you. I don't care. I just I wanted to show it off, and I also <laughs> want to into his room. He'll 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 post if it's unflattering. He'll post it on Instagram later. I'm sure. <laughs> he's pretty good at that. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, you can always count on Jules for that. For but, the uh, he's got a photo last uh, last night of me just halfway through a bowl of ramen, just like mid slurp of oh, my of my. Oh, noodles. I saw. Yeah, yeah. That was that was the thing. <laughs> Um, Jules, are we out of uh, mailbag questions? Are we, are we wrapping this thing up? We, or we can uh, go ahead and put this thing to bed. Right on. So, Hayato, uh, this is the part of the show where I definitely want to plug the work that you're doing because you've been doing some killer stuff lately. Where can people you. track you down and consume your content until net neutrality is repealed and then that's all gone? <laughs> Uh, well, these days I've been on Android Central, so I don't know if I have like a slash editor slash, you know, URL, but, uh, you know, head out, head out over to Android Central and you'll find my work there from time to time. Otherwise, I'm, as always, just on Twitter, you know, Snapchat, don't add me on Facebook, but uh, pretty much <laughs> everywhere else, I'm, I'm just Hayato Houston. It's simple. Right on. Okay, folks, so this episode of the Pocket Now Weekly, it's over. Uh, but even though the show is gone, the conversation continues on Twitter where you can find Hayato as at Hayato Huseman. We'll have a link down below this, uh, this video or in the, uh, the show notes for this video. Since Jules Jules is, spell, right? No, I, I, I won't be even able to, I, I have it <laughs> on a web browser in front of me and I'll probably still misspell it because your name is not that hard and it triggers what little like dyslexia i might it might have <laughs> you're gonna, in gonna the way that those letters are arranged wingstop uh hato houseman sure and jules is at point jules and i'm humbly at some gadget guy pocket now is around the web on twitter instagram facebook google plus youtube and our home site pocketnow.com and if you speak the espanol definitely check out es.pocketnow.com shows like this cannot exist without your support sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and by dropping reviews on itunes stitcher google play and wherever else podcast reviews can be left once again we want to thank this week's sponsor eero definitely hit that promo code at checkout pocket now get yourself some free overnight shipping to really step up your mesh wi-fi game i went mesh i won't go back but ultimately, there would not be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness. So make sure you tune back in. <laughs>